Lecture 8, Ethical Dilemmas. We've spent a good amount of time now talking about different ethical principles, ethical concerns, even setting out for ourselves a kind of philosophy of ethics. And we got specific. We gave specific ethical guidelines, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, ethical guidelines from across Scripture, love God, love your fellow man, and moving through the different guidelines that Scripture gives us, teaching us how to be good ethicists. One of the problems we might have or encounter, though, in this discussion is what we do when two of those principles seem to collide. In ethicists or in ethical discussions, these are referred to as ethical dilemmas. The cases where two principles seem to stand in conflict, and there's not any apparent answer for how, how to navigate between them. So just to represent this graphically, you have a situation, something where two major principles that you need to take into account now are, are catching you in between, and you've got to decide, or at least it feels like, you've got to decide whether to obey the one or obey the other, to violate the one or to violate the other. A couple of examples that just arise from philosophy or that are given as kind of classic examples. One of the oldest instances is Plato, and he sketches a situation in which someone has promised that he will return something. He's borrowed something from a friend, and so on a certain day, he promises, I will return this. Well, the problem is the thing he borrowed is a weapon, and on the day that he promised he would return it to the friend, the friend is angry and vindictive and threatens that he's going to go kill someone. He says, I would kill this person if I'd only had a weapon. And so now are you going to return the weapon when it very likely would lead to the death of another human being? Or will you wait and fail to keep your word? Okay, so you have this situation of kind of a tension between two concerns or two things that otherwise would be the right thing to do. Jean-Paul Sartre gives another example, and this is taken now kind of classically from World War II, the German occupation of France. And uh, a person faces a decision whether he can liberate his country from the Germans or whether he would stay and care for his mother. And she's the only, or he is the only son left. The others have died in war. And so he's deciding between a duty to his mother or a duty to his country. And you can get worse than this. It continues on. Another classic popular example you hear are that the soldiers are coming and they say to you, are you hiding anyone in here, a certain group of people that they're seeking? Are you hiding anyone in here? And your answer to them, oh no, but truthfully you do. So do you lie to save a life? Another example is William Styron taken from Sophie's Choice, and it's a case of a prison guard forcing a mother to choose one of her two children, which one will you kill? Would I kill her or would I, would I kill him or would I kill him? You decide. And if she will not choose, if she refuses to make a choice at all, then he says he'll kill them both. Okay, so these are the kinds of situations that we discuss as quote-unquote ethical dilemmas, situations where you can't quite decide what to do. Now, building my way out with some of this, I would like to point out that these are kind of extreme examples. These are the examples where we give when we want to be really dramatic and make our point in a big way. I would contend that there are sort of at least similar situations. I don't think any philosophical ethicist would refer to these as ethical dilemmas, but there are, let's say, daily level decisions that have at least a tone of this. So if you find yourself in a situation where you have finite time or finite money, okay, that's all of us, and you have to make a decision with that. So should I spend my day uh, reading and praying and focusing on my spiritual concerns and my spiritual needs, or should I get out there and work and provide for my family, or should I spend time with my family because I love them? Well, see, all of these are legitimate concerns. I think it's great for you to spend time reading and praying, maybe not all day. I think it's great to work and supply for your family, but that shouldn't be the only thing you do. And I think it's critical for you to spend time with your family and love them and 
focus on serving them, but that can't be the only thing you do either. In other words, in all of life, there's this kind of constant kind of push and pull tension, and we're always having to weigh out, yes, what are ethical concerns or ethical values about how to live life well? Those things always in a kind of a tension or balance. There's always a balance here that we're drawing. So all of life, in fact, is a kind of balance of conflicting interests and concerns. We could talk about certain biblical examples of something that looks quite a bit like an ethical dilemma. So 2 Kings 5, 17 to 19 is the situation of Naaman, Naaman the leper. And having been healed now and having come to understand who the true God is, he now brings up a little bit of an issue. He says to the prophet, if you would give me two mule loads of earth, from now on, I will not offer any burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. So Naaman has expressed his exclusive faith in the God of Israel. Okay, so far, so good. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When I go into the house of Remen to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. Now, um, a couple of things, excuse me, it's when my master goes to worship there, leaning on my arm. So uh, a couple of things, just so we understand the passage for a moment. I do think a major part of the idea here is that Naaman is anticipating a day when he would go into, yes, the house of a false god, but it's with the king. And the king, in association with Naaman, apparently, it's hard, a little bit hard to sketch out, but the, the king probably bowing down to this god in the house of Remen. And the question now goes, if Naaman stands straight, if he refuses to bow down, is that kind of an issue of disrespect? And so how is he going to relate to the king when the king goes in and the king bows down? It would give the impression that Naaman views himself as above the king somehow. What will he do? Okay, that's the issue that's at stake. And with that issue, then, there's a bit of an ethical dilemma. Because he's guaranteed, or he's promised, he's committed to only worship the God of Israel. But what will he do in respect to his society and the people around him? Another classic example is Rahab. And this is the case where the servants have come, they've stayed in her house, and afterwards then the authorities are coming to ask, where are they? So this is almost an exact parallel or an explicitly parallel situation to what I described earlier, the soldier saying, are you hiding any of this group of people? Rahab's solution to this problem is that um, when they demand, bring out the men who have come to you, she's hidden them, right? And she says, true, the men came to me, I didn't know where they were from. And so when the gate was about to be closed, the men went out. I don't know where they went. Pursue them quickly. And so the soldiers run after them. But as soon as they're gone, then we discover in the story, no, she had brought them up to the roof and she had hid them. All right. So uh, explicitly, Rahab lied. And the question now goes, is Rahab's lie somehow a morally defensive action? Because it sure sounds like it. Everyone else in Jericho is going to die. Rahab alone will live. And she will live because of her faith. In fact, she appears in Hebrews 11 as an example of faith in this respect. Now, that isn't, isn't exactly um, a complete justification for everything she did. Samson also appears there. Gideon also appears there. So we're recognizing that morally tainted individuals did appear in that list of people. But in any case, something stands that Rahab is in some way blessed, and this was in some way an expression of faith for her to protect these men. A situation like that as well. This is the midwives in Egypt. So the midwives feared God. They were told by the king of Egypt to murder the young babies. They let the male children live instead. The king of Egypt called them, why have you done this? Why have you let the male children live? Why have you not? obeyed my orders. And the midwife's answer was, well, it's because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They give birth before we get there. It's actually not really true. The reason for the babies not dying 
is that these midwives are allowing them to live. I mean, we were just told that. They let the male children live. And so the simplest answer to Pharaoh's question, the most direct, the most accurate to the information would be, those babies are not dying because we don't want to obey your orders because we don't want to kill those children. They answered something that was, I guess, realistically misrepresenting the information. God dealt well with the midwives. The people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, God gave them families. God blessed them for their action, which included saving the lives of these babies, but yes, also included at least turning the truth in a direction that Pharaoh would misunderstand or that he would come to a different conclusion. This is a really interesting case. Um, God has sent Samuel to anoint David. Samuel is aware, however, that if he goes to anoint David, that Saul might take him and murder him. So God's answer to him, go, you shall anoint this new king for me, him to whom I declare. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and he came to Bethlehem. The problem is, if Samuel does this and Saul's angry, won't lives be at stake? And God has an answer for that. Okay, Samuel asked, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord's answer, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So Samuel did what the Lord commanded. He came to Bethlehem. They came out trembling and they said, do you come peaceably? They're aware or suspicious that something big is going on. And Samuel's answer is, well, consecrate yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he invited the sons of Jesse to the sacrifice. Okay, the more, most forthright direct answer would be, Yes, I've come to anoint a new king. But he doesn't do that. He comes and mentions something else he'll be doing, not including the details of actually what is the most important element of his visit. Daniel chapter 1 is an example that I, I won't go into with so much length, but this is the case of Daniel um, in the situation where he might be forced to eat the king's meat. And if he does eat the king's meat, it's not ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean. So it's not following God's law in respect to foods. And that would then be a violation of God's commandments. And so Daniel actually purposed within himself that he would not defile himself with the king's food. And he seeks out a way. We'll return to that passage a little bit later. A very parallel passage in this respect, Daniel 6. This is Daniel when he's thrown to the lions. But you remember in that situation that he was faced with a tension between refusing to pray or by implication praying only to the king rather than praying to his God. And so in this case, again, we have a tension between two principles. And a final example we'll look at is Jesus in the Sabbath. We could look at it in a number of passages, but Matthew 12 is one of those where Jesus is challenged with the issue, has he obeyed the Sabbath laws? Now, all of these are biblical examples. I think they support the notion, at least, of situations where two ethical principles collide. You're having to deal with principles in tension. You're wanting to obey both, but it's not clear what you should do or how you should do it. And along that line, or just as a way of getting to where I want us to be with thinking about it, um, I would like to propose a situation that's a little more modern or contemporary, a situation you might face. So I'm going to paint a scenario. Um, this scenario is taken or just kind of adapted from one of the examples that a student gave when we had this discussion. And so let's say you're in a situation where um, you are doing your best to follow God. You want to obey his commands. You want to live ethically. You want to live well. Your family has some issues. Your father is alcoholic, is an alcoholic, and he struggles with this nearly every weekend. He gets very drunk. On many weekends, he gets violent. And so this weekend, he started the normal routine. He started drinking. He's, at this point, not he, he's extremely drunk. He's not even really capable of uh, getting himself around very well. And he's run out of alcohol, but he... he wants to keep on drinking. He isn't really stable enough to get to the store. And in fact, he's not really supposed to be 
buying it all. There's been issues with the local authorities where he's he's caused problems in the past. And so they've told him that he shouldn't be buying and, and that he has to get his alcohol some other way is the only way he's been able to get it, getting other people to bring him because the local stores don't want to sell to him anymore. So here's his situation. And he turns to you and he demands that you travel to the liquor store for him and buy him more alcohol. It's a demand. And you know him. And you know that he probably will get angry. He probably will get violent. So what do you do? Do you enable your father's alcoholism? Do you go and buy for him? Do you refuse? On the recognition that I need to, well, for one, not be guilty of buying this and actually enabling him in his binging. So I don't want to enable his sin. But on the other hand, you want to honor and obey your father. He's your father. And you want to avoid, certainly, you want to avoid him becoming violent. So how do you get out of this situation? And there are various theories for ethical dilemmas. Now, these are, I say theories, these are more theoretical. These are just ways of trying to understand even the concept of how the pieces fit together. I'll mention first three that are, I would just say they're non-Christian. These are not really representative of ideas that we would accept or agree with at all. I, I don't think they're valid ideas at all. And those three are um, each because they reject core ideas that, that we just as Christians have to hold to. The first is antinomianism. This is just an idea that there are no moral laws at all. So with this framework, well, you know, the, I, the argument would go, there are ethical dilemmas because ethics isn't really a thing. <laughs> ethics falls apart. You can't really trust the ideas at all. And so you have no confidence that, that the principles will even stand together. We just give up. Situationalism is a moral, moral relativity idea. So the idea goes, hey, just in each situation, there aren't really any guidelines that would stretch across all of reality. There, there isn't really anything consistent. And so you do your best or you do what works in the situation, what's best for you. Um, it, it's going to just allow for a lot of flexibility in the way you set up your ethics. And thirdly, generalism. And generalism is an idea that some kind of general laws exist, but they aren't really consistent. So the laws are kind of all over the place. And therefore, you can't really be sure that there's anything absolute and solid. Okay, all three of these ideas are ideas that are out there. They're philosophical proposals. But I would say none of them are really compatible with Christianity. There are, however, three that we ought to talk about as, yes, legitimate possibilities for Christian ethics. And the first theory for this is lesser evil. Okay, sometimes this is resting on, or this is going to be described as conflicting absolutism, an idea that you have absolute principles, you have absolute truths, but yes, they might be in conflict. And so if you're thinking of the example that we gave earlier, that you have on the one hand, the command not to murder, the other hand, the command not to lie. Well, so then the a supposition of this idea would be, yes, in fact, those things absolutely can be in conflict and are in conflict. Now, it goes further than this, though. The idea of lesser evil is that no matter what you do, you're going to be guilty of something. And this is the way that in philosophical ethics. This is the way that an ethical dilemma would be defined. I mean, an ethical dilemma is defined as a situation where no matter what you do, you will violate the ethical standard. You will be guilty. In Christian terms, then, the idea is no matter what you will do, you'll have sinned. No matter what you do, you will be guilty before God. You will be forced to sin. You ought to ask God for forgiveness. And none of the choices that you have available to you is going to escape, are going to help you escape from this. So then the supposition or the suggestion of this method would be, look at the two options, go with a lesser evil. In this case, it's fairly obvious that lying is sin. It's fairly obvious that killing is sin. 
I mean, you don't want to be responsible for the death of another human being. And so if they ask you the question, is the person here, you know that the person's going to be killed. Um, you don't want them to die. And so you, you lie instead. Okay. Furthermore, after they leave, you feel guilty. You know that you lied and you, you know that that was a sin. And so you ask God for forgiveness and you move forward. And the answer is, this is the way it is living in a broken world. Sometimes you just, you have no choice. You will be faced with the situation of having to sin. I find some of this problematic. For one thing, just the idea that there is no way to obey God fully in the situation. The idea that no matter what you do, you're just going to sin. And why? It's, it's really nothing more than just, well, you were caught in a bad situation. I mean, you might have done what you should have done all the way up to that point. And it's at that point then that you're caught and you're stuck. And so you just do something. I think this has really problematic implications for the virtue ethics side of things. In other words, what does it create within you? And the idea that now you're going to habituate or you're going to get accustomed to just sinning. And yeah, it's supposed to be like, well, I just sinned. Oh, well, I mean, it was a sin and I feel bad about it, but I'll ask God for forgiveness. Okay, can we move on now? I don't know that that creates good things within the heart. The impossibility of obeying God, the impossibility of living well in that sense. And remember that sins also often give way to sins, meaning that let's say you lie. Well, you might be caught up because of that lie and having to give a further lie in order to protect yourselves, yourself. And lies building on top of lies might catch you in a situation where let's say someone could uh, take control of your life because now they can go to someone else and say, well, he lied and he's guilty and they can pull you into further acts, further sins by holding you hostage by the knowledge of what you did. I mean, right? You just ended up, end up in a really impossible ethical situation where there is no good way to live well in light of this situation. The only way this works is if you can somehow narrow it down and only look at that one situation without recognizing everything around it. This is a very narrow concern, but it's, a, I think, a big one. Um, the implication of this regarding Christ's own life would have to be that either Christ sinned or that Christ never faced ethical situation, uh, ethical dilemmas. And I think the latter is implausible. I, I don't think it's possible or really reasonable to think that Christ went through his entire life and never faced an ethical dilemma or a tension like this. And therefore, the implication would have to be that Christ sinned, which of course doesn't work at all. So I, I don't find the lesser evil option to be a really great one. I find it problematic. A second option is called the greater good theory. This rests on a deeper theory when it comes to the nature of ethics, graded absolutism. So absolutism refers to the idea that ethical principles are absolute. They stand. They, they are unmovable, immovable. And yet the graded absolutism is an idea that different commands have different levels of seriousness. So some commands are going to stand as a higher order or a higher command, and other commands will be a lesser concern, a lesser sin or a lesser, a, a lesser demand from scripture. So we do have examples where, for instance, different commands have different penalties. You can just go through the Old Testament law and you can find, for instance, that God gave different penalties for different sins and some sins are more serious than others in the sense that God gave a higher kind of penalty for it. So there's something there that there is a, a legitimate idea of heavier or weightier sins, at least in terms of the kinds of commands or the kinds of punishments that come if you violate them. Jesus spoke of the weightier matters of the law. And if therefore it's possible to talk about weightier matters of the law, then it, by implication, there are also lighter matters of the law or things that maybe don't carry the same weight of seriousness. In one case, Jesus also spoke of someone's sin being the greater than another person's sin. So he was guilty because their, the, Judas was guilty because his sin was heavier 
or weightier. And Jesus also spoke of the greatest commandment. Well, if there's the greater commandment or some kind of sense of weightiness with a commandment, then we would expect the same with also judgment or with also sins. Sins could be weightier and lighter. So this is a legitimate idea as far as it goes. I wouldn't disagree with the notion that there is a kind of a hierarchy. I wouldn't disagree that we could say that, let's say, uh, co committing murder is more serious than having a lustful thought, right? I mean, at least the earthly implications of committing murder are really immense. And you're talking about the death of a human being irreversibly. Um, you could have a momentary lustful thought and then think, okay, wait, no, I can't do that and turn your mind away. Okay, so I, I don't view those two acts as parallel in the sense of the weightiness of those sins. And if we just extend that out now, maybe you have a situation where you're having to decide between the death of a human being versus, um, you know, momentarily disobeying something that your parents told you to do. Okay, well, I think you can figure out what you ought to do in those kinds of situations. I think there's a concept here that's legitimate. And the notion of the greater good would be if you choose the higher law, the higher on the hierarchy, you're no longer guilty for the lower. Okay, so that's not a concern, obey the higher law. Uh, an un underlying kind of fundamental basis for that is an idea that evil does not exist in itself as a thing. Evil is just the absence of good. And so in this case, you do the greater good, and therefore the evil is not really viewed as a thing that you committed. Okay, there are some ideas there. There are some problems too. A problem here is establishing the hierarchy. In other words, it, critical to this view would be you get everything in order, the highest commands above and the lower commands as you move down. And it would be critical to know or recognize what are the highest commands and what are the ones that come below. You've got to know what this hierarchy is. A critical question then is how can you find the hierarchy? As in, how can you define, defend, support, and prove the hierarchy? I see arguments like what I showed you earlier. You have the greatest commandment, the second like unto it. So love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. There are even discussions about whether that itself is a kind of a hierarchy. Loving God is the first and the foremost, the most important thing. And then second to that, you love God on the, or love your fellow man on the second level. I find that not very helpful. I think the two probably ought to run in parallel. See, so even there, defining your hierarchy is a little broken. Where would you go to scripture to support an idea that one command goes higher than another command and that you can stack that up or how you fit all those commands into the framework or the structure? So now we're asking questions like you know, honoring parents or stealing, which one is higher? And how would you, where would you go? How would you have that discussion? And let's recognize it's not just as simple as all cases of stealing versus all cases of honoring your parents. So honoring or dishonoring your parents might be a question of whether you say, yes, sir, in a specific situation, something relatively minor. Down to stealing might be something, you know, whether you're going to take a, a very, very small amount of money, a couple of cents or a couple of centavos or something. And over here now, you're talking about a tiny amount of money versus a tiny amount of disrespect. I mean... So we're into an impossible quandary of trying to figure out what are the highest, the greater, what fits on the higher part of the hierarchy. How do you do this? So I'm going to go to a third option that I view as also an authentic Christian option, and it's, it's my preference among these. And I'm going to call it unqualified absolutism. Unqualified to say that the commands of Scripture, absolute commands, the ethics that Scripture gives us, are unqualified and they never conflict. Rightly understood, and those words are critical, rightly understood, I'm arguing, God's words are never in conflict. The key here, I think, is understanding the laws not as, if you want to imagine, various planks that are thrown down. Each one is a separate piece. And so you toss down this plank, thou shall not murder. Throw, toss down this plank, do 
do not commit adultery, toss down this plank, honor father and mother. And each of them are just kind of like individual boards laying out there and you're trying to figure out how to fit them together. It's critical here to understand that all of scripture and the ethical demands it gives are more like a network. All of the pieces are connected together. And so therefore, as you do your analysis, you're not really pitting this versus that. You're recognizing that these work together and you're trying to figure out how they work together to find a way through the situation, recognizing it all as integrated. In fact, I think this helps us understand a bit of what's going on with ethical dilemmas. I think we get into trouble with these situations when we absolutize a single law, meaning we take a single concern in the situation and we raise that up to an impossibly high level and we're viewing that as the defining concern rather than taking the time to understand the entire situation, all of the concerns together, process how they all fit together in order to come to a conclusion. We have to take everything into account. We have to be able to think of God's laws as guidance, where all of it is united into one, and we make our decisions accordingly. I'll give you one analogy here. If you think about randomness, you're going to throw some dice or you're going to mix up some cards. Um, the concept of randomness it strikes us, okay, when you throw the dice, anything could happen, right? Any number of, any number could come out of the dice roll. The interesting thing about randomness is there's not really exactly true randomness. If you knew enough of the factors, you throw the dice down and it's at the exact angle you threw it down and the exact speed you threw it down, it's the surface that it lands on and even crazy things like humidity and things like that. When it hits the surface and how it's going to bounce, then you could calculate that bounce and then the next bounce and the next bounce and each one until it finally settles. And uh, theoretically, nobody's going to be able to do this. Theoretically, you could analyze all that out and say, well, here's the number you would get based on that speed at which you threw it. What's going on with randomness is just that we throw so many factors into it that it's impossible to calculate. No one could run it backwards and figure out what would happen. The tiniest little difference in how you throw it down would make all the difference in how the, the, the dice bounces. And so no one can calculate it. And I wonder here if kind of in a parallel, ethical dilemmas might not be something that's essentially or philosophically different than any other decision, except just that they've become so complicated that our minds are struggling to analyze our way through. In other words, these are the situations that just got so hard, they don't feel immediate and natural. Okay, no other concern. Someone comes up to you and tells you to do something and they say, but it's not true. So just say this. And that's nakedly a lie. And you just say, okay, I shouldn't do that. But an ethical dilemma is a situation where layers and layers and layers and layers of things are stacked up. And in order to work through this situation, you're going to have to work down through the layers, understand them all. It's going to require a lot of you. And just to further analyze this out, it helps us, I think, to recognize that ethical dilemmas or these situations, they arise because we live in a sinful world. These are situations that are not normal. They're paradoxical. They're messed up. They're confusing and complex because life has become confusing and complex. It is a function of sin and the sinful world we live in. It is a post-fall condition that now all of these situations become so impossible to navigate because you're surrounded by people that are sinners. You're surrounded by ethical ambiguity. You're surrounded by lies and confusion because you yourself are confused about how to work through something. All of this is a function of a world that was never supposed to happen. Post sin, post Eden, outside of Eden, the world has become messy. And the result then is that you're going to have to work at it. The diagram we talked about, the person caught between two sides and having to navigate between them, gives us kind of an, a, a little bit of an idea for this. You're going to have to creatively look for a middle path where you can navigate between 
or taking into account both concerns. These situations are going to require a lot of creative thinking. They're going to require a lot of close attention to the biblical principles. If I'm using the example I have here, you're going to have to spend a lot of time, not just with a simple surface understanding, but really taking the time to get a, get a deep understanding of what lying means, of what murder means. You're gonna to have to study the commands well. You're gonna to have to pay attention to biblical principles. You're gonna to have to work your way down through not just settling for simple reductionistic answers, but really struggling. And these situations will require a high degree of faith. How do you sort it all out? You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to struggle through. A little bit of encouragement along that line. I would encourage you to think of these as, yes, difficult situations that none of us want to be in. All of us would like to pass over and not have to face the situation. And yet an interesting insight in them is I think that these are an opportunity to grow. So view these as, yes, painful, nothing you would want, you'd like to avoid them, but painful opportunities to grow as an ethicist and as a believer, to grow in your faith. And as that, then embrace them as an opportunity to have to work hard, to come up to another level, a richer, thicker understanding, and to struggle through. And finally, I would observe, just as a practical um, encouragement, when you come to a conclusion on them, be prepared for different believers to have different conclusions. In other words, you've worked through, you've struggled through, and you've come to, here's what I ought to do. I, I would argue that it might be, for you, the right thing to do. And for another person, they might come to a different conclusion. Some of that might be that it's possible that I'm wrong, it's possible that they're wrong, but see, it's critical to maintain possible that they're wrong. Some of it might just be that our situations are different. In other words, for me, for my family, for my situation, for what the boss said, the situation was such that this is what I should do. And another situation that kind of seems parallel, actually, it's not. There's a little difference between them. And so the person went a different way, but they should have gone a different way. In other words, what I'm arguing here is ethical situations are complex enough, leave enough room that you allow for other people to come to a conclusion that differs from yours. I have biblical support for that. 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 is an extended discussion of meat that's offered to idols. And in this situation, Paul is recognizing that there are legitimate considerations here. I mean, he'll point out, for instance, that it's true an idol is just a nothing. And so there's a part of you that could say, well, okay, you know, it's just a rock. Let's not pay attention to it. Let's not worry about it. He gets a little further down in the passage and he recognizes, however, that idols are pointing to something deeper and nastier. In fact, he says that when you're talking about idols, that food is offered to demons. I wouldn't want you to participate with demons. You can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So is an idol a nothing? In a certain sense, it is a nothing. In a certain sense, it is a something. And therefore, now you've got to maintain some considerations or some possibilities here. There are cases where you should just eat. Eat with the knowledge that, well, okay, whatever God has made is good. The earth is the Lord and the full, Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you eat without raising any questions. But there's other cases where someone says to you, this has been offered to an idol. Well, then don't eat it. Why? Because of the sake of conscience. Why should my liberty harm someone else's conscience or be determined by someone else's conscience? And so I, I, I ought to then carefully navigate through. All right. I have situations where depending on the very specifics of how something was said to me. I might eat or I might not eat. And the point being, there's room here for believers to come to different conclusions. Allow that room. And the last thing I want to do then is to provide you a little bit of uh, suggestion for how you could work through these situations or what to do. I've argued that you'll need to understand the biblical principles well. I've argued that you'll need to think creatively. 
You'll need to work through the details of it very rigorously. I've argued that you'll need to pray and seek a third way or seek an option creatively that would help you navigate between these. Can I support that biblically? If you go to a couple of the instances I gave you, they're going to give you some insights. Daniel chapter one, remember this is the meat that has, it's not prepared according to the Jewish law. Daniel is going to be forced to eat food that would defile him. So what's he going to do? How's he, how does he handle this situation? And look at the details carefully. Daniel is quite clear. He is resolved that he will not defile himself. He won't do it. But how is he going to navigate it? Well, he goes to the chief of the eunuchs and he asks, could I possibly not be put in this situation? Daniel found favor and compassion, and yet the chief of the eunuchs recognizes that this is a big deal. People might die. I fear, he said, that if things don't go well, you could endanger my head to the king. So Daniel has already asked the chief of the eunuchs, and though the chief of the eunuchs would like to work with him, that's a dead end. There's not a solution. So Daniel instead goes to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned. He goes to the lower level. Daniel proposes a test. Give us a test just for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, you observe and you see. And I think the fascinating thing of this is that Daniel's faith has to be that he's trusting in God to deliver him. I mean, he's trusting that God will do something. It's kind of an idea, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, it's on you now. <laughs> I'm giving this situation to you. I've had situations in my life that work like that. And I think this is a very good expression of faith. Lord, if you want this, it's in your hands. I'm giving it to you. Pray, seek a way, beg his help, set it before him. And that's what Daniel did. And yes, God delivered. A little bit later in chapter 3, we have another case, not Daniel now, but it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're also caught in a difficult situation. What will they do? This is the image of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar has demanded that when the instruments are played, everyone is to fall down and worship. Well, you know the story. These three men refuse to bow down and worship. And as a result of that, they are going to be killed. They're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. God ultimately delivers them. All I would like to point out from that passage is, in this case, I have a situation where they're caught and there might be a temptation to kind of, you know, I don't know, you could drop something and then kind of bend down and pick it up. Like, well, I wasn't bowing down to the idol. I was just picking up. You know, I, I dropped my pen on the floor and reach down and pick it up, right? Um, You could find a way to kind of go through. That's not what they do. There's a case or there's a time when one has to just say, I can't. And the consequences are going to be dire and it might be all the way to the point of death, but I'm okay with that. An uh, example, finally, that fits in along this line, Daniel chapter 6. And I say, finally, the last example from the book of Daniel. This is a case where the law has been that no one can bow down to any god besides the god, besides the king. Daniel refuses to follow this. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, so he knows the information, he went to his house where he had windows. He got down on his knees three times and he gave thanks to God and prayed as he had done previously. I don't have time to break down the passage. It's critical that you recognize language here as he had done previously. The notion is Daniel wasn't just trying to create an issue. But Daniel is recognizing if I don't pray at this point, it gives an implication that I am following this command. The people around me will think that I have given in and I can't give in. Okay, so what's happened here? Again, Daniel has kind of put his case before God. He's taken into consideration a concern with testimony, not just that people would like him, but in this case, that people would not have a misunderstanding about the truth. He wants to protect the truth. And so he's going to be willing to suffer for it. Okay, not every solution for an ethical dilemma takes away the conflict. We'll return to that idea later. You might pay for the choice you made. That's okay. The choice or the question is that you do the right thing. But actually, though Daniel gives us a lot of interesting help, 
for thinking about ethical dilemmas. I'm going to argue that the best case for us with ethical dilemmas is at the center of the biblical story. And it's the person who is the best example for us as an ethicist. The best ethicist in the history of the world is Jesus Christ. And you have these kinds of situations, maybe they're ethical dilemmas, maybe not, but they at least have the structure or the nature or the feel of an ethical dilemma. So I'm going to look at a couple of these with you. Matthew 12, Jesus is going through the grain fields. His disciples are hungry. They begin to pluck grain. The Pharisees call him out. Your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And what follows in Jesus' answer is extremely helpful for helping us process what's going on with this. A couple of things. Number one, recognize that the Pharisees and their demands here, your disciples are doing what is not lawful, very important for us to qualify here. Jesus is not violating the law. So in that sense, you could argue it's not really an ethical dilemma because Jesus never violated a law. Jesus violated their traditions about the law. That's important. So there is no violation of the law here. But Jesus' analysis is still helpful, how he points this out or how he clarifies his position in respect to the law. And a couple of things he does. Number one, he points out from Scripture two different cases that show that people might or will work on the Sabbath, and that's acceptable. So in the first case, very clear law that the bread of the presence was not lawful for anybody but the priests. Jesus points out, yes, but there was a case where David, in hunger, facing death, ate the bread. He wasn't supposed to eat the bread, but here we're talking about a life and death situation, and that's commendable. A second situation, the priests in the temple are not following the the uh, the traditions of the elders in the sense they're doing things in the temple that would otherwise were they not in the temple be considered kind of a violation right so there's cases here with biblical warrant where a person is doing things that the pharisees would never technically accept but they have to because well look they have to fulfill it because scripture itself mentions it. All right, what I would like to point out about that is then Jesus has taken the time to understand scripture well. Jesus recognizes with close attention to detail things that are contained in the word of God. A second principle or a second pattern. I have the language here that starts to sound a bit like the greater good sort of notion. Jesus says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And a bit later, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I don't think this is actually, it sounds like, but it's not actually a greater good notion. The idea is a little different. And the idea goes that Jesus is the one that the temple points to. Or Jesus is the one who can tell you what Sabbath keeping means because Jesus himself is the Lord or the declarer of the law regarding the Sabbath. And what I would say here is Jesus has taken the time to understand, to recognize, and to explain that the Sabbath and the temple are not ends in themselves, but that they point to him. More on that later. But the point of it is, think about the purpose of the temple. Think about the purpose of the Sabbath. They're not just for themselves. They point to him. Notice in between that I have an idea that sounds a bit like virtue ethics. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. I I think the idea here is don't just think of obedience to God's law as strictly, well, I did the things, I checked the boxes. God's desire is mercy or God's desire is the heart. God desires the heart, not mere external compliance. I think that helps us with our ethical dilemma situations. What is my heart in this situation? And is what I, what I am doing, is it coming from a, a correct motive and a correct desire? What would it create from within me of faithfulness and obedience to God? If I keep moving on from this passage, the next section, a separate story, is also a Sabbath issue. And the question here is Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath. And the question becomes, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They raise this issue in order to accuse him. And Jesus points out two things. Number one, which one of you has a sheep 
If it falls on the pit on the Sabbath, won't you take it and lift it out? And then his argument is, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Okay, so what he's done is he's pointed out the sheer hypocrisy of their standards. Their standards are even allowing for you to go out and to take care of your animals. Well, you know, the animal might die. Sure. But they're, Jesus is pointing out, and so if you can take care of your sheep, I can't heal a person. He's pointing out the hypocrisy of their traditions. And second, he's pointing out here, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And the idea of this is act ethically. And acting ethically in order to help a human being, well, the Sabbath is a, a, a principle designed for the benefit of the human being. Help the human being. In fact, that becomes even clearer in a parallel passage in Mark, Mark 2.27. And we have the language here explaining that the Sabbath was made for the man, not the man for the Sabbath. Don't let the Sabbath, which was designed to be an opportunity for rest and flourishing, to then become such a governing, controlling law that you're actually harming people. You're actually making it more difficult to live rather than any kind of rest or enjoyment. You've turned the law on its head. Okay, so if I'm taking some of those pieces together, I think this is what's rich about it, is that Jesus takes the time to understand the true underlying purpose of the commands. It's not just now we're, tr we're, we're isolating out a command, remember my idea earlier, absolutizing a single command, treating it like it's a board, disconnected from everything else. It's not part of the network. And you just pull it out separately. And then you make that an absolute. You've got to keep all the details of this. Now, understand that command and its details and work to keep it, but recognize how that command fits into the network of everything. What is the purpose of the command? And what's the role of the command and how it fits into all of the other commands? And seek to obey that all together. In so doing, we're going to have to spend time understanding the nature of the commands. We're going to have to spend time understanding the nature of the situation. We have to think about where this situation would go and what it would cause or create. What are going to be the results of this situation? And we have to also understand what is this doing to my heart? What are my motives? What are my responses? What virtues or vices is it creating within me? What habits is it forming? And how do I handle those things? But if I take all of that and I've done my analysis, I'd like to just recognize as a concluding thought that that doesn't guarantee that everything will work out well. I mean, I've talked about ethical dilemmas here. We've sought for a way through. We've sought for a kind of an answer. And I've recognized that these can be complex. I've recognized that you will have to work hard. They can be painful. They will test your faith. And yes, even if you've done this analysis and you've worked through it carefully, you have no guarantees that the problem is solved or it will just go away. In fact, it is part of the nature of ethical dilemmas. Sometimes you suffer. Daniel nearly died several times. Daniel was cast into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into the fiery furnace. You've got people that nearly died because they did the right thing. They handled the ethical dilemma well, and yes, they suffered for it. That also can happen. That is also is a possibility. And most important of all, I talked about Jesus. In Jesus' case, he did actually die. There is no guarantee here that your situation will be easy. Fundamentally, remember ethics. The goal of ethics is to live well. And that doesn't mean then that you would escape suffering, right? Those are different ideas. So the idea that you would live well means that you did the right thing. You made the right choice. You have lived wisely. But it doesn't mean that the suffering is taken away. Fundamentally, our goal is not to escape suffering in ethics. If we were designing our ethic as do X, Y, Z, and you won't be in pain, that's a different ethic. Our fundamental goal is not to escape suffering. It is to do the right thing. The goal is, of ethics is not to have a life free from pain. It is to have a life lived wisely. 
a life lived well. And you get that kind of discussion in 1 Peter 3. Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? And yet it can happen that you might suffer for righteousness sake. So that would be painful. That would be hard. That would be a difficult thing to work through. If you do suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Remember, Peter's drawing this from the Beatitudes, Jesus' words. Have no fear of them. Don't be troubled. Honor Christ in your heart. Be prepared to make a defense. Have a good conscience. Because it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. You might suffer in a situation like this. And let's recognize then that the ethical dilemma might not end well. You do your best. And at the end of it, critically, you entrust your soul, your heart, your life to God, and you ask his help. In fact, I could go one step further. Think about now the biblical story. And all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the framework of that story, at the center of the story is a climactic event. And that climactic event, the cross, the death, the resurrection of Christ, defines the rest of the story. In fact, I would argue here that some of the principles we've just talked about, the tension between two concerns and how they meet and how they might pinch you in the middle, how they might crush you in the middle, the recognition that you might try to do your best and you might suffer even though you did the right thing or because you did the right thing. What if this kind of ethical dilemma stands at the center of the entire biblical story? A God whose love compels him to draw us back to himself, and a God whose justice demands that we be dealt with for our sin. How would a good God who loves us deliver us and yet also treat us justly? Or to put this in the words of Romans, how can God be both righteous and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus? The righteousness of God demands that we be judged, but his love draws us to himself. And I would argue then that at the center of the story, we have something like this kind of dilemma or something like this kind of conflict. The solution to that, the supreme ethicist, our God, maker of heaven and earth, sends his son who suffers and dies for us innocently and righteously suffers. He lives perfectly so that he ought never to have suffered our sin, yet he carries our sin. And the result of that is that there is a solution. God's righteousness and justice, his love and his grace come together and we are forgiven. We are justified of our sin and God is righteous in doing so. See, but it costs the death of his son. It costs the suffering of the righteous one. And as you then might face a difficult situation, think, pray, beg God for help, understand the commands, work through all of the implications of what's going to happen and what it would mean. You've got to think hard and think much as an ethicist to analyze and work through biblically what you ought to do. And at the end of it, know that you have standing at your side, Jesus Christ himself, who for your sake suffered and died so that you might be forgiven. Ethical dilemmas then provide us an opportunity to turn to God in desperation, to work hard, to think hard, and in the end, to remember our Savior who provided a way that we might be righteous in the sight of God.